Okay, so this is what the question says. Um, a dialogue gas expands quasi-statically from some volume. Uh, let me start labeling those to some final volume at a constant temperature of temperature T. And it says, follow the steps below to calculate the number of molecules in the gas um, with some additional information provided. Um, let me read ahead to check one thing. Number of molecules. Uh, Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, so there will be additional work <laughs> provided. So um, maybe I should provide a little bit of a background for this question. Um, so this is actually a textbook question. And um, in the textbook, they don't give you a lot of help. And I thought that was um, kind of hard for... Um, I thought it was unhelpful. So this uh, rewritten version of uh, it is my attempt at being helpful. <laughs> and whether it's uh, actually helpful or not, it's a separate matter, but I leave that to you. But let me just show you the textbook version of the question where this comes from so that you can see the way it's written. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah. So it's uh, this question here. It is found that dilute gas expands from the volume at some temperature. It does this amount of work. And it asks how many moles of gas are present. And if you are experienced in physics problem solving, as in um, you feel comfortable setting up your system of equations based on information given, double check if you have enough information, and then after you have everything, you know, same number of equations as number of unknowns, and then just go through the algebra, solve it. If you are uh, familiar with and comfortable with that approach of problem solving, then this is quite doable question. But um, to students who may not be quite as comfortable with that, because um, this is a kind of question that's asking it uh, backward. <laughs> the forward version of the question would be where the question gives you the pressure, the volume changes, temperature, and the number of moles of gas, and it would ask you, okay, how much joule of work is done? That forward version of the question is the kind of question that uh, people who are less experienced in physics problem solving maybe. Um, if you are, say, um, the first time you see an equation, the first thing you do is plug in numbers. I'm describing you, people who are less experienced in physics problem solving. Uh, that kind of um, uh, forward direction of problem solving, it's a, I think it's going to find that easier. At least I get fewer questions from students about those questions where the direction of problem solving is forward. Questions like this, it's, a, it's backward. You have to move back. and um, when you are working backward like this, um, you have to set up algebraic expressions and uh, really feel comfortable working with the symbolic um, expressions. Because when you are working with the symbols, you don't mind. It doesn't matter too much that uh, that uh, that you are not given the number of molecules of gas that you might need to calculate the work. Um, so. So this is written in this step-by-step uh, -step format to walk you through doing that. So let me <laughs> walk through this uh, with you on video so that I can show you how, how that goes. So, so as you are reading the description of this problem, you should have noted that it's saying a constant temperature. And so that kind of information is important to register and use as you're doing the problem solving because this is telling you that it's an isothermal process you're working with. And there might be some things about isothermal processes that uh, you have seen in your textbook reading and you have to remember that. So one of the things that you hopefully remember is that if you draw the PV diagram for this um, um, for this process, the question description has given you your starting volume, your final volume, and it's only told you that it's a constant temperature. And when you're so isothermal processes, 
um, move uh, the kind of movement on a pressure volume diagram for an isothermal process. They move along an isotherm. Isotherm looks uh, kind of like one over x graph. And the biggest, most important thing here is that this one over x curve, it's a function of V pressure changes. So if you started out at this temp this pressure here, then your final pressure will be different in order to keep your temperature the same. So this isotherm I've drawn might represent T equals 310 Kelvin processes. And as this quasi-statically at constant temperature expands from one volume to the other, the pressure is constantly changing. Sorry, my drawing is bad. It's, it's not a line, it's kind of a curve. Um, so your pressure is constantly changing. Or your pressure is changing. So uh, no, it does not remain constant. And um, that becomes a need for part B, <laughs> where we will go through calculus to um, relate work done with other things that are given. So that's the second step of this tutorial where we are working through, okay, um, we have some limited set of information. How can we relate more stuff to it? Um, if a pressure does not remain constant, we cannot calculate the whole amount of work with this. Instead, we need to start out with the infinitesimal work done for infinitesimal volume change. So this is what it's referring to. Uh, let me just the diagram that on PV diagram, uh, clean up. The, this portion here. So you can imagine a very small portion of your uh, thermodynamic process. Maybe as your volume is changing from some point to an uh, infinitesimally larger volume. So this would be V plus dV. And uh, over this change of volume, you do some amount of work. And here, the you can make the interval so small that the amount of pressure change is negligible, then this uh, area under the rectangle would be your infinitesimal work done. This uh, small area is what you would call infinitesimal amount of work done, is the, the value of the pressure at this point times the this small uh, volume change interval, dV. That's what this is describing. And uh, and you integrate this over the entire volume interval. You imagine breaking up this larger volume interval to these infinitesimal pieces and add it all up, Riemann sum, <laughs> take a limit of the Riemann sum to the limit where dV is infinitesimally small, that's your integral. <laughs> so we're describing that. So um, this part is going to walk you through uh, Setting up the integral. So fill in the blank for the setup for the integral below in terms of the volume, number of molecules, and temperature and Boltzmann constant and the numerical. Okay. Um, so to start, um, I would uh, set up this. So this is the infinitesimal amount of work done. So infinitesimal amount of work done is equal to pressure times the infinitesimal change in volume. So, um, so to get this left-hand side, to get the total amount of work done, you would integrate this from some initial conditions to final conditions. Um, so here, in terms of the variable V, which is the quantity we are being given, it would be from some initial volume to some final volume. Ah, and I think here's where you see the problem. This original expression is in terms of pressure, and you don't see pressure anywhere ever in this problem set. Um, so, so you have to think of how else can I bring in some information about pressure? And as you're thinking through, I hope you remember ideal gas law. So once you remember ideal gas law, PV is equal to N Boltzmann constant times temperature, or I guess for this question, we are not using uh, subscript to be, which is fine. Um, so out of this expression, we can solve it for pressure. Then you get pressure is equal to NKT over volume. 
And looking at this, I think every quantity here is something that is either given or allowed. Uh, I have a number of molecules, which we don't know yet, but we are gonna, as long as you're working through algebraically with the symbolic expressions, it's fine that you don't know its number. Um, and you have Boltzmann constant, temperature given, we have the number, and this volume is the variable. So with those substituted in, this looks like from initial volume to final volume, uh, substituted in for pressure, and kT over V times dV. And uh, one final check, it's good to check that when you have an expression for integral like this, you have your um, the variable into, of integration. That's a one of your, well, that's the one and the, it should be the only variable. If any of these other quantities are changing, then you should find a way to re-express them in terms of your integration variable. And in this case, because it's isothermal, your temperature will be at constant at this value. Great. So the expression here should be just uh, nkt divided by 3. And um, Mathematica, this kind of expression is fine. I think, uh, um, I mean, if you want to be sure, you can put in some spaces. Oh, it doesn't let me put in spaces. It's fine. Uh, the question is written with this variable declared, so they know what nkt stands for. They know it stands for n times k times t. So, so. so yeah, that's it. It's quite actually simple once you have it written down. Um, so it says, a parse says complete integral above and write down the work done in terms of these quantities. Oh, yeah. So this is where um, you have to remember some integrals. Some of what you covered in, I guess uh, it might be your calculus too. I don't quite know all the things you learn in math. Okay, I know what you learn in math classes. I just don't remember in which math class you learn specific things. Um, so one of the things that you learn in some of your calculus class is how to integrate uh, things like one over x dx. And that's this exact integral. And uh, this is, in fact, the con it, this ought to be the context where they net introduced the natural law. So the antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log of x. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, let me just go through two steps, I'm, or pretend to go through two steps. I'm going to factor out this constant coefficient. So I have this constant coefficient, n, k, t times, now I have the antiderivative, um, so that's going to be natural log of this integration variable v. And we evaluate this at two limits, uh, from v initial to v final. And let me do some uh, log logarithm algebra and simplify this. And I think in one of the lectures, I do cover the logarithm algebra. It's a good thing to review. <laughs> let me just uh, restate briefly. If you have a natural log of, uh, do it in different color. Let me um, restate very br briefly. If you have natural log of A plus natural log of B, then it's a natural log or equal to natural log of A times B. That's a one rule that um, you should know. And the second rule, uh, that's the only thing you really need to know, which is that if you have, um, um, if you have some number N, N times natural log of A, then you can express it, this as natural log of um, A raised to power of N. So, so yeah, I think that's it. And um, I say these two rules are the only rules you have to know because additional circumstances, like what if you need to calculate natural log of A minus natural log of B, you can actually get that from application of these rules one by one. So you can consider this expression and consider an application of this with n equals minus 1. So minus natural log of b, that's going to be equal to natural log of um, b raised to power of minus 1, or natural log of 1 over b. So this expression then becomes natural log of a plus natural log of 1 over b. Now you can apply the first relation algebra rule 
natural log algebra rule to get natural log of I can't write down uh, to get natural log of a times one over b or natural log of a over b. You might have given this a subtraction thing as a separate rule. Well, it, I guess could be, but I prefer to keep my number of rules as low as possible because the rules are the things you have to memorize and the fewer number of them you have to memorize, the more um, adaptive uh, problem solving you can do. So I'm going to use these uh, natural local rules to um, write out and simplify um, the expressions involving initial and final volume of the gas. So just uh, plugging in the limit, what you get is equal to nkt, there's coefficients in front. You um, plug in the upper limit, natural log of a final, subtract the lower limit, or version with the lower limit plug it in, natural log of v initial. And uh, from the natural log rules we have gone through here, they are to be equal to nkt times natural log of v final over v initial. And that's the final simplified expression. And I think the system should actually accept your answer in both forms. Either whether you answer this way or this way, it should be considered correct. Um, but the most simplified form that the uh, that shows your understanding of the setup the best is this one. So let me uh, when I scroll down, it's gonna mess up all the alignments. So scroll down to here. So yeah, natural NKT times the natural log of this ratio. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's it. And um, Note how the for the original version of what the textbook question was asking. Note, um, that, but so let me just uh, um, save this result here. Work done is this expression. I'm just gonna uh, move it up there to so that I have a reference to it. I mean, in addition to what I typed in. Um, so the very last question I'm asking is the question that your textbook led with. And uh, this is what I mean. Um, question that your textbook asks is complete on its own. It doesn't need additional explanations, but uh, to people who are not experienced in physics problem solving, it's uh, because it's a um, question that tries to ask backward, uh, as in it uh, gives you the kind of information that you would normally solve for work done, and then asks you for the information that would be normally be given number of molecules. So that kind of backward question forces you to basically go through most of the problems in symbolic terms, and then plug in numbers. Uh, you can actually see it here. When you take a look at this expression for work done, and this, you can see that it's an, it's an equation. It's an equality involving some of the quantities we are given. And um, so, so let me mark this way. Um, I'm going to mark all the uh, constant or uh, variables that we know the value of. Boltzmann constant, we know. Temperature, we know. We are given. The, the final and initial volumes, we know. We were given their values, so we can calculate their ratio. So so far up until d until they told you this the two things that we haven't known so far is work done and the number of gas molecules now the forward version of question would give you this and then ask you how much work was done we are doing the backward version of the question we are given how much work was done now we are asked for this so we just have to solve this algebraically for n so let me do that and i Solve this algebraically for n, I get n is equal to work done divided by kt times the natural log of v final over v initial. So you plug in the numbers and that's it. Uh, let me leave that for you. I'll just uh, submit and make sure my parts a through c are correct. And I will leave this number plugging in exercise for you. Um, we did the one thing to check. So when you do this, um, you should get a positive answer. Somehow, if you flip to the V initial and V final, you will get a negative answer. So uh, make sure you get a positive answer.
So wait, did I miss something in part? No, I guess. Does a part there? Oh, 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 I say again. It, I, there's only three possible points and there are four parts. Yeah. So, so yeah, fourth part, plugging in the numbers, then you should get some number and, um, you know, uh, so it should be a pretty large number. That's why I'm giving you this format hint about using the e notation. So, 